Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation, Monitoring Velocity Changes in Iceland with Fiber Optic Distributed Acoustic Sensing. My name is Regina and I'm a master's student from University of Hamburg. In this talk, I will present some results of my master's thesis. A common method to detect structural and dynamic changes in the Earth's crust is coda wave interferometry of emit noise data. By measuring delay times of the scattered wave fields that make up the coda of seismograms, we can detect variations of seismic wave speeds. A trade-off when carrying out those studies is the desire to have high temporary resolution by keeping the signature noise ratio of the data high at the same time. The latter is important to obtain robust and reliable results from the measurement procedure. Higher signature noise ratios are typically achieved by stacking over time. Thereby, however, we lose temporal resolution, making the data less sensitive to distinct environmental processes. Distributed fiber acoustic sensing, or short DAS, is a relatively new method based on Rayleigh scattering of photons in a fiber optic cable. Compared to even very dense conventional seismometer arrays, DAS provides an incredibly high spatial resolution, which lies often in the subrange of the wavelengths we are interested in. In terms of emit noise monitoring studies, we were wondering what could DAS add as a new contribution? Could we make use of the high spatial resolution by stacking the data not only in time, but also in space? Can this even compensate for temporal stacking such that we increase the time resolution of our measurements? We tried to answer these questions by carrying out a systematic study whose structure, methods, and results will be presented on the following slides. Let me first introduce you to the setting. The study area is Reykjanes, which is a small region located southwest of Iceland. Here, the GFZ Potsdam carried out DAS measurements in 2020 with a fiber optic cable that was originally used for telecommunication purposes. The location and orientation of the cable is shown in the right figure. The cable is represented by the black thick line and can be separated into two parts. One part with a length of six kilometers that extends from the city Grindavik to the north up to the geothermal power plant, shown as the right dot. The second part extends from the east to the west and has a length of approximately 15 kilometers. The channel spacing is four meters, which leads to a total number of 5,248 channels. The interrogator is located in Grindavik. Our goal is to monitor relative velocity variations beneath the cable over time. Subsequently, we want to relate the velocity variations to environmental processes such as earthquakes, volcanic activity, and weather impacts. For this purpose, we use the continuously recorded NG of the ocean's microseism. At first, we retrieve the Green's functions between different station pairs. This refers to the cross-correlation of the noise traces to obtain the seismograms that we would record if one station acted as a source and the other one as a receiver. Then we apply interferometric techniques to enhance the signature noise ratio of the coda waves. Lastly, we use the stretching method to measure differences in arrival times of the scattered waves in the coda. An example of a virtual source receiver configuration is shown on this slide. The red star represents the location of the channel that acts as the source. The gray lines show the ray paths of the waves between the virtual source and the receivers, which are evenly distributed on the whole fiber. If we compute all correlations between this source and every 50th channel of the cable, we obtain this image. The x-axis shows the fiber distance in kilometers, and on the y-axis the lag time in seconds is shown. For these correlations, 24 hours of noise recorded in March of 2020 were used. The data are bandpass filtered between 0.5 and 2 Hertz. The first six kilometers correspond to the north-south oriented section of the fiber. On this part, we barely see surface waves in the data. However, on the last 15 kilometers, we see one-sided surface waves that travel along the fiber. This part corresponds to the east-west section of the cable. The fiber only measures in the longitudinal direction. Surface waves are more emphasized on the east-west oriented part because this fiber section is roughly in line with the orientation of the fiber section on which the virtual source is located. In contrast, the north-south oriented part is not in line with the orientation of the source, such that the waves cannot be recorded by the cable. This means that the surface wave visibility 
depends, amongst others, on the angle between the cable sections on which source and receiver are located. That the correlations are one-sided suggests that the noise source distribution is not homogeneous, with stronger sources located west than east of the cable. This observation is consistent with previous studies, which localize strong noise sources south southwest of Iceland in the North Atlantic Ocean. To get an estimate of the surface wave velocity, we carried out beamforming. The velocity is 1.87 kilometers per second. As the surface waves have a dominant frequency of 0.6 hertz, we are dealing with wavelengths around three kilometers. Compared to the interstation distance of four meters, these wavelengths are very large. Adjacent traces on the fiber should therefore see basically the same. Could we take advantage of this abundance of information by stacking the data spatially? In theory, spatial stacking should cancel out the incoherent parts in our data by destructive interference. Thus, by stacking spatially, we should improve the signal to noise ratio of our data. Here and in the following, spatial stacking refers to the simple linear stacking of the traces in space prior to the correlation procedure and without applying any time shifts. Let's get a first impression of the effect of spatial stacking on the data. In the left image, again a correlation gather is shown. The virtual source is represented by the black line. Every 50th channel along the whole cable acts as receiver. The correlations were calculated for a day with a lot of tremor activity. Surface waves again show up mainly on the east-west part of the cable. However, the whole image looks pretty noisy. Apart from the overall relatively low signal-to-noise ratio, there's energy at around zero lag time, which shows very likely spurious arrivals. Since only every 50th channel is shown on the cable, this configuration is similar to a conventional geophone array. In the lower figure, the same gather is shown, but here we fully exploit the spatial resolution that provides stars. Each correlation was made up of 50 adjacent traces that were stacked together. We clearly see an improvement of the image. The overall signature noise ratio is higher. Also, the spurious arrivals are reduced. In addition, the surface waves on the a causal side of the correlations are much more emphasized. At the beginning of the cable, surface waves show up that were previously hardly visible. Spatial stacking of the data prior to the correlation procedure clearly enhances the signature noise ratio of the cross correlations. This should improve the robustness and reliability of the subsequent monitoring measurement too. In addition, we reduce our data set without just discarding traces. We still include the information of each trace in the analysis. The reduction of the data set makes it more handleable and reduces the computational cost. For example, if we reduce our data set by a factor of 50 and look at every possible combination of stations, then the computational cost is reduced by 99.96% as we don't have to compute 11 million, but only 5,000 correlations. However, spatial stacking is a common method in seismology when analyzing direct waves, but we look at the coda, which reflects a diffusive diffuse wave field with waves arriving at different angles from different directions. This suggests that we need to be careful when stacking spatially. But with an interstation distance of four meters and wavelengths of three kilometers, we should be able to stack in space at least up to some degree. The main question is, how many traces can we actually stack together? And then in the context of monitoring, how does spatial stacking affect the measurement of the relative velocity variations? To investigate this in depth, we carried out a synthetic study. To simulate our real data setting, we created a set of harmonic waves with wavelengths of three kilometers in a period of 1.6 seconds. The first trace is placed at x equals zero meters, and then we shift all traces in space by a distance of four meters. By so doing, we obtain the time shifts that we also measure in the real data between the traces. The lower figure on the left shows all shifted waveforms up to a distance of 100 meters. This means that 25 adjacent traces are displayed. In the right, still empty figure, I will show how the correlation coefficient between the trace at zero meters and the stack traces for an increasing stack length evolves. On the x-axis, the stack length in meters is shown. We also investigate the dependency on the noise level shown on the y-axis. For now, let's focus on very low noise levels. If we stack up to 25 traces, thus 100 meters in space, we obtain very high correlation coefficients. 
However, the values decrease, the more traces or meters in space are stacked. Let's look at the dependency on the noise level. If we increase the noise level further and further, then we see that the yellow region representing very high correlation coefficients shifts towards lower stack length. This means that the higher the noise, noise level, the less traces can be stacked together. To summarize, assume, assuming a relatively low noise level, then we obtain high correlation coefficients for a stack length of up to 200 meters. This means that we can stack spatially up to a distance that corresponds to 6.6% of the original wavelength. We use this value as an orientation for our further analysis. To test spatial stacking with real data, we select two sections on the cable whose channels have a good data quality. Both sections are marked in the map and have a length of 1.2 kilometers. We investigate 164 days of data spanning the months March to mid-August of 2020. We apply the following workflow. At first, we stack N adjacent traces spatially together. We filter the data between 0.5 and 0.8 Hertz and apply one bit normalization in spectral whitening to remove the influence of earthquakes and further increase the signal to noise ratio of the correlations. We compute daily correlations between the channels on section one and those on section two, which leads to a total number of 164 correlations for each station combination. Subsequently, we define reference traces for each channel combination by stacking all 164 traces. A reasonable, tempor a reasonable temporal stacking value has to be identified prior to the actual measurement of the velocity variations. Let me explain this step a bit more in depth. Therefore, please note that the velocity variations will be identified by measuring deviations of a certain number of k temporally stacked correlations with respect to the reference trace. The parameter k thus refers to the stack length of the correlations in time. Here we see an example of a correlation for an arbitrary channel combination. The coda windows are marked for both positive and negative lag times. To identify the optimal temporal stack length, we look at the evolution of the signal to noise ratio over time, shown in the figure below. On the x-axis, the stack length in days is shown, which, ref which refers to the number of daily correlations stacked together. On the y-axis, the signal to noise ratio of the coda is displayed. Results are shown for different distances over which the noise traces were spatially stacked prior to the correlation procedure, starting with zero meters, which means that no spatial stacking was applied at all, 24 meters or 0.8% of the wavelength, and then going up to 200 meters or 6.6% of the wavelength respectively. The different stack lengths are illustrated in the upper right figure. Depending on the noise level in the data, we obtain correlation coefficients between approximately 0.85 and 1 between the stacks and the original waveforms. For all cases, the signature noise ratio improves the greater the stack length in time. Thus, the more days are stacked together. Clearly, this effect is even more pronounced the more traces were previously spatially stacked together. These results imply that we indeed gain time resolution if we stack the data spatially prior to the correlation procedure. The next step in the analysis is finally the measurement of the relative velocity changes. We use the stretching method, which is based on a grid search over a reasonable range of stretching values that account for nonlinear phase shifts in the coda of the correlations. Let's first consider the results if we don't apply spatial stacking at all. They will be shown in the figure on the right. The x-axis shows the whole time period from March to mid-August of 2020. On the y-axis, the results for different channel combinations will be displayed. In the upper plot, velocity variations will be shown. In the lower plot, corresponding correlation coefficients between the optimally stretched waveform and the reference trace demonstrated. A relative velocity change is typically considered as reliable if the corresponding correlation coefficient is greater than 0.7. We first have a look at the results for the channel pairs whose channels are located on the eastern ends of the channel sections as demonstrated in the map. The channel in section one acts as virtual source, the channel in section two acts as receiver. The results are now shown in the right figure. Blue colors indicate slow, red colors high relative wave speeds. Now we move a bit on the cable towards the west and take the next combination of channel pairs. 
We can keep going until we cover the entire cable sections. Now we can identify the mean and the standard deviations by averaging over all station pairs. Two time periods in the plot are shaded with gray color. Those periods are associated with magmatic intrusions taking place east of the cable. As we are analyzing more or less the same area, we would expect a high match between the measurements of different station combinations. However, although a certain spatial coherency seems to be present, the relative variations are rather randomly distributed. The corresponding correlation coefficients are overall very low and demonstrate that the found variations are not reliable. Thus, they should not be interpreted in terms of structural changes in the crust. Here I show again the result for the case when no spatial stacking was applied. Now let's look what happens if we stack over an area that corresponds to 3.2% of the wavelength. This result looks already much better. Some channel pairs in specific days still have very low correlation coefficients, but overall the values are much higher than in the previous figure. The velocity variations are, are much smoother and show a better spatial coherency. For a stack length of 6.6% of the wavelength, the result is further improved. The correlation coefficients are very high except for a few cases. We detect relative velocity changes up to 1% and we can identify several trends in the data. At the end of March, a velocity drop occurs seen by all channel pairs. An inclined branch with high relative velocities emerges firstly on channel pairs at the eastern ends of the channel sections at the beginning of April. It seems to migrate along the cable from the east to the west over a time period of approximately one month and is followed by a low velocity branch. Another branch in July and August shows a similar trend. These observations suggest that we can observe how different parts of the cable responds to dynamic changes in the Earth's crust. To interpret our results in an environmental context, we must know what processes took place in Reykjanes during our time period. At first glance, the areas with high relative velocities suggest a correlation with the magmatic intrusions such that the waves are faster during periods without magmatic activity. This, however, cannot yet be concluded with certainty. Reykjanes is a geologically very heterogeneous area as it lies just above the mid-ocean ridge. Seismic zones, volcanic systems, and geothermal area ca areas characterize the region. Therefore, it is very challenging to constrain the environmental processes that explain our results. To conclude, what processes our data reveal is as yet unclear. This is still work in progress. What is clear, however, is that our results suggest that DAS holds the potential to track rel relative velocity variations not only in time, but also in space, and thus monitor dynamic variations in the Earth's crust in time and space. Spatial stacking enhances the data quality and the reliability of our results. It helps detecting velocity changes that cannot be identified with only single stations. It also reduces the data set without losing trace information. This makes the data set more handleable, which is of particular interest in large end settings. To answer the question we asked at the beginning, spatial stacking can compensate for temporal stacking and increase the time resolution of our measurement. This makes the data more sensitive to environmental processes. These were some results of my master's thesis, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. Please don't hesitate to contact us if there are any questions. Thank you very much for listening.